is uh, about greed because we're doing the seven deadly sins. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing is when I say greed, you could be greedy for anything after all. I mean, look behind me, I'm greedy for books uh, and I order <laughs> more books than I will probably ever be able to read. Um, and, and that's a kind of greed. Uh, so, however, um, when we talk about greed, we almost invariably are talking about money. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because greed is generally associated with money. And when you say that someone is greedy, you generally mean that they are greedy for money. Not always, but generally. And when we talk about the seven deadly sins, um, of which greed is the next to last, I believe that we will be covering, we have sloth next, and then we'll go on to other sinful subjects. Um, but when we talk about that, <clears throat> we are in fact talking uh, about um, people's attitude towards money. And I want to start off by saying that um, in my own life, uh, I grew up in a family that never, ever spoke about money. Um, I remember maybe one conversation with my father ever about money, uh, and it was just not a topic of either interest or of discussion um, in my house in almost any way. When I came as a, a rabbi to Los Angeles and to Sinai, um, I learned two things about money that I did not before really know. The first is its enormous power in the world in all sorts of different ways. Um, and the second is that discussions about money are almost never just about money that it is a deeply emotional topic in different kinds of ways for different people. And that that <clears throat> is part of the reason that you have uh, the sin of greed. And I want to begin by saying that, that um, the love of money as money is a is a mistake that is um, that I'm going to define. In fact, those of you that watch the Daily Inspiration will see this tomorrow in the Inspiration. And I actually put it on my Facebook page this morning. Has a difference that um, between intrinsic and uh, and um, instrumental values. A distinction that is made in that Seven Deadly Sins book that I've shown you before um, by Schimmel and. Intrinsic values are things that are valuable in and of themselves, and you don't have them for another reason. Like a good story, generally, is intrinsically interesting or valuable. Um, you don't tell a good story necessarily for something else. You don't love someone for another reason. However, there are many values that are instrumental, not intrinsic. And so, um, for example, the example that I gave this morning was vision. Why do you want good vision? You want good vision because you want to be able to see things. Vision is not intrinsically valuable. It's instrumentally valuable. It's so that you can see things in the world, right? There was nothing ever to see. If the world was always black and dark, vision would be irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> Part of the problem with greed is that money is an instrumental value, but too often is emotionally related to as an intrinsic value. That people love money for money's sake and not because, for example, they could cure diseases with money if they had enough money. And I think that part of the, um, part of the deeper issue about what greed is about is exactly that. It is the confusion of the instrumental with the intrinsic. Um, and so this uh, gets us to the question of greed 
and what greed does to people and to their um, way of being in the world. Now, part of the reason that this obviously is so complicated is that we live in a capitalist society. And those of you who remember um, Michael Douglas in that movie, he's, where he gives the speech that says greed is good, uh, there is a part of the desire for money that obviously can be good. Um, the desire to make a living, first of all, is intrinsically worthy and gives you dignity. And second, so many things that people do in order to make money are good for the world, right? Like make <laughs> drugs that, that can vaccinate you against COVID. That's a good thing. And if someone didn't have a desire for profit and for money, probably would not happen. Um, or almost certainly wouldn't happen, as is true with many innovations, which is why capitalist economies are so such dynamic economies, because they use people's self-interest to motivate them to do things in the world that are important. Um, and, uh, and money is a great motivator. But again, sins are almost always the perversion of natural impulses in ways that are destructive or dangerous. So when we talk about lust, the sexual impulse is not in and of itself bad, but can be bad. Um, or if we talked about gluttony, eating is obviously not in and of itself bad, but can be bad. And, and the same is true with every impulse we're talking about. The impulse to make money is not in and of itself bad, but can be bad depending obviously on how it's um, viewed and exercised in the world. And the desire for things um, that is somehow intrinsically related in some ways to the desire for money is something that of course a capitalist economy thrives on. And that's why advertising and constantly telling you that you need more things is part of what uh, such economies do. Um, <clears throat> so, having said that, there are traditions that see money as in some ways inherently sinful or bad. Judaism does not view money that way, has never viewed money that way. Um, from the Bible onwards, you don't find statements like, you know, money is the root of all evil, um, which I think is, is self-evidently not true. Um, and you don't find uh, statements like you do in the New Testament where it's as hard for a rich man to get to heaven as it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, um, which again, I think is self-evidently not true. Now forget the heaven part, whether that's self-evident or not, but the idea that someone who is wealthy can't be moral or can't be good or can't be as good as someone who is poor or better than someone who is poor or vice versa, I think that, that your, your wealth and your possibility for morality are not necessarily connected, although in one way, in one way they are, which is really important to remember. <clears throat> and that is, there is a correlation that is found in study after study after study that the wealthier you are, the more detached you tend to be from other people and therefore the wealthier you are, the less percentage of your money you give to charity. It goes so far as the bigger car you drive, the less likely you are to stop for pedestrians at stop signs. Um, and the reason is the bigger the car, the more you feel a distance. It's a natural human thing. It's not because rich people are bad and poor people are good. It's that the, the, you feel a greater distance between you and the person in front of you. And therefore you don't feel that sense of solidarity and community that you, because so much of being very wealthy is being able to isolate yourself from other people that you don't want to interact with. And therefore paradoxically, people who are poor tend to give a larger percentage of their money to charity because they feel a greater solidarity with other people who need, <clears throat> um, charity. It is also true, of course, that even if you give a smaller percentage when you're rich, you might get more in absolute terms and have a greater effect, but you still give less percentage wise. So the, the effects of money on the way people um, 
operate in the world is significant and have a lot to do with the way, um, with our human relations. But it is not true that money makes you bad or that people with money can't be moral or they can't do good in the world. I mean, that's just transparently untrue. Um, so the, <clears throat> so the, the tradition, as I said, does not make the mistake um, of thinking that people with money are bad. Uh, and the, the thing that makes, <laughs> that makes money bad is the desire for money for its own sake. Um, people who have, for example, and this is certainly true of many people, um, there are people who have more than enough for the rest of their lives and yet are ruthlessly devoted to making more money. They don't need more stuff. They're not doing it in order to advance a business because the business does anything worthy for the world. It's just because they want more numbers in the account. They want to move up the list of wealthier people. Um, it gives them some kind of psychic security to know they have more and more and more and more. And, and that security and or insecurity is at the heart of greed. The idea that someone would die rich seems to be obscene. You shouldn't die rich. You should use your money in the world before you die for the, for the good of other people and to do good things in the world, especially if you have a lot of it, like to accumulate billions of dollars and not use it for the, the good of humanity is, is almost, it's not almost, it is a kind of psychic sickness that, um, that afflicts people and, and makes it very hard um, to understand if you're outside of that circle. So, there are uh, some examples, uh, the example of the vineyard of Naboth that uh, is a well-known one um, in the Jewish tradition in the book of Kings. There are examples of people who want something and will do anything to get it and it's because of greed and it's not because they need it, right? Um, it's also the parable that Nathan uses uh, when he speaks to, uh, when he speaks to David about Bathsheba, where he says a rich man had all these sheep and a poor man had one sheep and the rich man took the poor man's single sheep. Um, and and the, that kind of grasping um, desire is clearly um, aptly called greed. And for our society, uh, the the necessity is far more to counteract greed than to stimulate self-interest by and large. Um, that is the sense of community, the sense of interdependence, the sense of solidarity, the sense of we are all in this together, the sense of no single person really um, is, is worth billions more than another human being. Um, even though they may have that much more money. That's a really important message to, to drive home to people who live in a society where there are such vast disparities of um, not only of wealth, but of possessions, of, uh, of education, of almost all the goods that uh, money can deliver. And so, um, the question of greed is in some ways deeply relevant to the constitution of American society, because on both sides, there is something important to be said and to be learned. 
the side of the engine that drives an economy that is capable of doing great things is the side of self-interest and drive. And to blunt that or to diminish that is to take away part of not just what makes America America, but also part of what has given us the enormous advantages um, over our ancestors in, in medieval times or in ancient times in terms not only of convenience, but of health, of, uh, of lodgings, of comfort, of all the things um, that innovation and creativity and dynamism and, and science and literature and, and all of this uh, and, and painting and everything has given us. And yet at the same time, it is dangerous to lionize, to, uh, to overpraise the drive towards money itself because it makes money intrinsically good when money is not intrinsically good. Someone who has billions of dollars and doesn't use them in any way to make the world better is no better and has no more in an ultimate sense or a spiritual sense than someone who has almost nothing. Um, and so, to, as I said at the beginning, Money is almost never just about money. And to get it right, that is to esteem it and not to worship it, to, um, to seek it but not to obsessively pursue it, um, that's the balance that has to be struck in the sort of Maimonidean golden mean. You know, Maimonides following Aristotle talks about the golden mean um, and, and, and classifies virtues that way, um, like between selfishness and selflessness, there is a healthy altruism. Um, between you know, greed and lack of any initiative, there is a healthy self-interested drive. Um, and that's really, uh, I think, a, uh, a balance that communities easily get wrong. Um, I know a lot of people whose main interest in life, and I say this with no irony or diminishment of meaning, whose main interest in life is how much they have, how much they'll make, it's what they talk about, it's what they think about, it's what they wake up thinking about, it's what they go to sleep thinking about, um, about the various vehicles making money, about the various kinds of investments they can make to make money. And, and it is about the money. It's not about, therefore, I will be rich and I will be able to provide for my family and give to charity and do these good things in the world. No, it's about the money. And, and that is a kind of spiritual sickness. Um, and, and I think that uh, it is one that Americans have to face up to and be aware of without um, falling into the trap of saying that money is irrelevant and it doesn't matter and you shouldn't try to succeed and, and make money that gives you power in the world and that that power can't be used for good. Um, for example, the fact that the Jews are by and large a wealthy community, there are obviously poor Jews, um, both America and abroad, but the Jews are by and large a wealthy community. I see that as a very good thing because wealth does give you power and we know what it is to be powerless in the world. So, but, but it's not the money that in and of itself is valuable. It is rather the ability to be self-protective, to advance interest, to do what you think is good, to help what you think is right. All of those things that actually matter. Um, and, uh, and so this, Sin is in some ways a particularly interesting and problematic one um, because it is, um, um, it is like, like most of the really tough sins, the really um, difficult ones. It's not something that you can entirely dismiss. Uh, it's constituent of living, right? You have to have something to trade and barter in order to get whatever it is, food, shelter, you know, clothing, so on. 
Um, and so you can't just say, I will have absolutely no concern for money. The closest you can probably come um, is to be uh, someone like uh, Demosthenes. Um, Demosthenes, I think it was Demosthenes, who, uh, who had one possession, he had a cup. And, uh, and when he saw a, uh, a boy drinking by the sea with his hands cupped like this, threw his cup away. So he wanted nothing. Um, and, and the legend goes that when Alexander the Great came to him and realized that this great philosopher was there, he said, can I do anything for you? And Alexander the Great had conquered half the world. Masih said, yes, you can stand out of my light. In other words, you know, you're blocking my son. That's all you can do for me. Um, and, and so uh, that kind of exaggerated love of poverty and hatred of possession, that's not particularly Jewish. It's not, it's not Jewish, frankly. Um, Judaism does not idealize poverty. Uh, you know, the, um, the line, <laughs> I hate to quote Fiddler on the Roof, to quote, to show a Jewish attitude, but in this case, it happens to be perfect. The line from Fiddler on the Roof is right. Um, that uh, it's no, it's no uh, disgrace to be poor, but it is no great honor either. Um, and this, and remember that these, uh, remember that the, those, Fiddler on the Roof was based on the stories of Sholem Aleichem, uh, the greatest probably of the Yiddish writers, um, and and that what he was and that it reflects real attitudes in the Jewish community because they knew, they understood what it means to be poor, and so they were not prepared to idealize poverty because poverty meant disease and and discomfort and and sometimes um, not enough to eat and not a decent place to sleep and not being able to take care of your children. And so Judaism was not inclined to say, oh, poverty is great. It's a good thing and people should be poor. Um, and, and yet at the same time, sometimes I must say, uh, when I see the lavishness of some of the celebrations in our community, I think that some of the spiritual meaning is lost in the enormity of the expense um, and the, uh, the sort of dazzle um, of the celebration. So it is a tough balance to strike. Uh, and, and we understand that um, to be greedy is basically to treat money as something that, that should be cherished in and of itself. And, and that's not what money is. It's not what money is. Money is a tool. Uh, it's a tool to, to to, to do for oneself and for others. So, um, yeah, I love that story. Marla mentioned Mother Teresa. The story is told of Mother Teresa, whether it's true or not, it should be true. It might be true. I'm gonna say it's true of uh, when she was treating lepers in Calcutta and the journalist uh, came to observe her and to write a, a story about her and said, um, God, I can't believe which I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa said, Neither would I. And that idea that it is the intrinsic value of what you're doing and that money is extrinsic, that it's instrumental, um, that's, I suppose, the essence of what it is to be greedy or not greedy. Uh, to think that money is what matters doesn't matter. The example that, for example, he gives in, uh, he gives in this book, if you want to think about what intrinsic and extrinsic are, is the boy who says to his father, would you put me up for adoption for a million dollars? And his father goes, no. He goes, how about $10 million? His father says, no. He says, like, is there any amount? And his father says, of course not. I don't care if you would give me like a billion dollars, I wouldn't put you up for adoption because the money is extrinsic and the love for a child is intrinsic. And so you can see the distinction so clearly in that. And yet there are unfortunately people who see money as an intrinsic um, and a uh, and a goal in and of itself, um, and it is our task to hold on to both ends. It's worth, but it's not ultimate worth. Okay, uh, there is my uh, my greed spiel, um, and um, tell me if you have any questions or comments or. Uh, Anything, please put them. Let's see what I have in the chat here. I have go. <laughs> I already went. Um, so, uh, yes. Okay, I have one. 
Uh, yes. I suppose that the, Jennifer says that the, um, the, you could see Moses smashing the tablets as that, uh, as that, as a, um, as a metaphor. Um, but, okay, so, um, prior, yeah, I think that it is true, what Quentin says is that, um, there is a long tradition in Judaism of professional classes and so on and so forth, but there is also a long tradition of very wealthy balavatim, of very wealthy givers in communities. Um, the difference in America, and this is surely a difference, is for example, in my father's synagogue, there were wealthy people, but it was a different time in the country. It wasn't just a different time in the Jewish community. Wealthy people did not live in different places from those in the middle class. They lived in the same communities. They lived in houses next to each other. They drove basically the same cars. The proliferation of luxury goods um, and of bigger houses and the gradual separation of the classes where the rich really are separate, at least in my lifetime, that has grown and grown and grown and grown, and not only in the Jewish community, but in the community in general. And I don't think that it's an entirely healthy development for the reasons that I said. Um, so yeah, I think that that's true. I remember, I've told the story before, there was one man in my father's synagogue in Philadelphia that drove a Rolls Royce. And I remember he once came to our house and uh, to, to drop off a bar mitzvah gift for my older brother. And I'll never forget that we looked through the blinds of the window in the front room at the car as though it were a creature from another planet. We'd never seen such a thing, like a real live Rolls Royce. It was like a mythical, it was like a dragon come to earth. Um, that's how different and alien that was. Uh, you know, whereas now, I mean, not only the world's voices are common, but when I go down to, when I go down to the, um, to the uh, garage in my own synagogue, it looks like Rommel is sending his tanks through um, to conquer the garage at Sinai because one car is bigger than the one before it until they're like as spacious as, as little homes. Uh, that wasn't true when we were younger. Uh, it was a very different, um, it, is partly, it is partly, I suppose, the inevitable result of societal prosperity, but it also, I think, in some ways reflects the, um, the uh, outsized acquisitional impulse that um, a very wealthy society brings. Uh, and, and it has consequences, as you know, it has consequences. So uh, what can I tell you? Don't be greedy, stop it. Um, and we all have to watch ourselves. It's not like, as I said, depends what it is that you love and desire and how it manifests itself. Um, so Questions, comments, anything more that you have to say about, I, I'm greedy for more questions. Um, I've spoken for a half an hour now. I mean, it's your turn. Uh, by the way, um, as long as we're uh, pausing and I'll pause for a minute, I don't know when, but I hope sometime in the next couple of months, these classes will resume as in-person classes. And, uh, when that happens, um, we'll have in-person questions, presumably. And this Shabbat, you know, is the first Shabbat that we will be back in the sanctuary, 25% social distance. People have to pre-register and have to be members and all of that. But still, we will be back. And that is a, a beautiful and a wonderful thing. And, and if nothing else, um, for many people, the pandemic has taught them that there are a lot of things that they thought they could not live without that they actually can live without. Uh, and that's not a bad thing to learn. It is not a bad thing to learn. And sometimes you only learn it in extremists. So uh, 
So if that is, uh, if that's it, then I will tell you that next time we will be studying sloth. And so you can be late to class because that way you'll be embodying the idea. Uh, I thank you. I wish you a wonderful week. Be healthy. And maybe I'll see you for Thursday morning Torah class. Uh, we didn't have it last week because of Pesach, but we will be having it this week. So Thursday, nine o'clock, right here on your favorite Zoom channel. Take care. Bye.